Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to today's session, Fostering the Growth of Emerging Leaders. I don't think we could be talking about this topic at, at a more critical time, as we really face some real challenges individually and collectively as we all look to start um, reopening our businesses and, and of course, engaging staff, keeping staff engaged and attracting new staff are all top of mind for everyone. So I think we've got a, a lineup of wonderful young leaders of tomorrow, which I'm, I'm really thrilled to be sharing the stage with you today and looking forward to uh, presenting all of this to you um, throughout our session. Can I first of all start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we all gather today um, and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I just want to go through, first of all, uh, just a bit of housekeeping, which um, I think most of you, if you've joined us before, are really familiar with our processes, but just wanted to remind everyone that um, your microphone, of course, has been muted and your camera is turned off. Um, I would ask that when you uh, post your questions, can you please make sure that you post them into the Q&A box, not the chat box, just makes it too hard to kind of bounce between the two platforms. So please put all of your questions into the Q&A box. Um, we will be, because we've got three different speakers today, each talking about um, individual topics, we'll actually be doing the questions at the end of each one of those segments. So we'll make sure that all of your questions get answered by the appropriate person. And I just want to note, as you would have heard, that the session is, of course, being recorded today. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. Thanks. Next slide, please. Um, as I've said before, you know, I think right now the issue of emerging leaders and the issue of encouraging um, the youth of tomorrow, the youth of today, the leaders of tomorrow to actually be, you know, deeply engaged in our industry and working with us as we plan our future. We're really thrilled today to be um, presenting to you three various segments that we are connected with, but also I just wanted to get you across some of the, the different platforms that we currently have, um, have access to and that we support through VTIC. Um, we're very pl proud of how much um, we have supported our emerging leaders through a range of programs and scholarships over several several years now, many years really, when I think of the Todd Blake Award, for instance. Um, the Lynette Bergen Award and the VTIC Student Entrepreneurial Award, we'll be talking about that today through our discussions with, um, with Brendan and with Vanessa. So I won't go through those in, in detail at the moment, but I did want to talk about some of the other programs that we sponsor at VTIC that are really important for our industry and our members to understand. Um, I mentioned the Todd Blake Student Award. That award is actually named in memory of our VTIC Chief Executive, and Victoria University alumni, Todd Blake. Um, the award is granted annually and is open to all Victorian University students in the tourism, hospitality, culinary or event management programs who have displayed the same passion, commitment and leadership and indeed the can-do attitude that Todd of course exhibited through his time with us. The prize of this prestigious industry recognized honor includes a cash grant of $1,000 and can be used for any professional, educational or personal expenses. Each year we look forward to working very closely with Barry Bruins from Vic Uni and the panel of judges to present this award to an outstanding university student. And Barry is our key contact on this event or on this scholarship, I should say, if anyone does have any further questions, we're happy to connect you with Barry. Um, of course, our next program we lovingly refer to as MTILP is, is one of the uh, favorites of so many. The Melbourne Tourism Leadership Program, as, as some of you would know, is a professional development program that offers people an opportunity to grow as leaders within our industry. VTIC took over as the custodian for this event uh, back in 2019. And we were very honored that Destination Melbourne chose to allow us to take responsibility for the delivery of this really important program that means so much to so many. Um, the program is actually facilitated, as, as many of you know, Mel Neal has been uh, the facilitator for MTILP for, well, since its inception, and has been an amazing, amazing champion for this program. 
It's all about, um, Mel is a, a positive psychology practitioner and consultant, and she's the founder and CEO of Mind Insurance. The program includes content that covers topics like values, time management, behavioral drivers, self-awareness managing, self-awareness managing, I should say, perceiving, using and understanding emotions, positive leadership and communication strategy, coaching and goal setting. And I know with so many of, of um, young leaders that I've spoken with, and it's interesting that program attracts such a wide variety of people that are interested, but it has brought so much value and so much meaning to so many people that have gotten engaged with the program. Um, if you are interested, applications for the 22, 2022 program are now open and you can simply visit our VTIC website to apply. VTIC is also very, very proud of its longstanding partnership with YTN. The Young Tourism Network is, of course, a volunteer-run organization that aims to provide students and new entrants into the industry with opportunities for networking and for future learning. Over its 16 years of operating, many hundreds of students and industry professionals have engaged with this really critical connection network. And as part of our partnership, with YTN, VTIC does provide secretariat and financial services to this group. And it's been a pleasure and an honor as well to work with them. Earlier this year, I'm pleased to say that the board of VTIC nominated two developmental roles on VTIC's policy advisory council, one of which has actually been set aside for representative from the Young Tourism Network Committee. And this will provide, hopefully, a tremendous opportunity for a young leader to contribute to the important work that our Policy Advisory Council will be taking on, and particularly over the coming months and, and indeed, years of our recovery process. The current representative from, YT, from the YTN committee is Hugh Fitzpatrick, and we're very pleased to have you here with us today. Hugh's been the chair of YTN for the past two years. Um, sorry, I'm just turning pages, Hugh, apologies. <laughs> um, and he's currently the general manager of government relations and advocacy at the Caravan Industry Association of Australia. And I really am pleased to welcome you here today to talk to us about the YTN and VTIC partnership, but most importantly, to really highlight some of the key areas that we wanna work on in the future together. So Hugh, thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Thanks a lot, Felicia. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, really honored to be here. I just wanna start by acknowledging the, the traditional owners of the land where I'm presenting on today, um, the Kulin Nation, uh, the Wondery people of the Kulin Nation, I should say, do wanna extend my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And it's great that VTIC has really taken the initiative here and, and gone into partnership with YTN to deliver an event um, like this. And also uh, another event in a, in a couple of weeks that's, that's really focused on, I guess, one of, some of the awesome stuff that, that young people are doing in Victoria's tourism industry. Uh, and today I just want to talk a little bit about Young Tourism Network, what we've sort of achieved in the last 18 months. And then, um, and that provides, I think, background to uh, where we see YTN and, and VTIC partnership moving forward uh, and how uh, young people are going to be, I guess, integrated structurally into, you know, um, all levels of the tourism industry. So as Felicia said, YTN, um, you know, we, we exist basically to empower students, new entrants and experienced professionals to connect, learn and grow. Uh, it's all about providing that pathway between uh, education and industry. Um, to sort of help them along the, the growth of, of professional development. As we know, the tourism industry, it's not a linear progression in terms of career. You know, uh, I started off scooping ice cream. I did tour guiding in Europe. I, I now work in government relations for the caravan industry. So, you know, it's a bit of a higgledy-piggledy path, which makes sense when you look backwards. But when you look forwards, it can be quite difficult to, to actually work out where you can go. So, so YTN exists to try to help out with that. Um, at the beginning of 2020, with the onset of, set of COVID, it became apparent that our role was really important um, in supporting and connecting young people with opportunities for, for support. Um, and there was this incredible outpouring of support, not just from YTN, but from established tourism professionals that were really keen to, to help out, provide their expertise, provide their guidance um, for young people who were going through a really difficult time. And I think YTN was really successfully marrying up this uh, demand for support, which was coming from young people, uh, and, and new entrants to the industry and the established tourism professionals. So we 
In 2020, we held um, 15 virtual events. So we had more than 500 attendees. Uh, we also ran an incredibly successful um, trusted advisor program um, with, the support of, with the support of Mel Neal um, and also uh, the support of Melbourne Tourism Leadership Program. And, and I really want to thank VTIC for, for their support um, in facilitating some of the advisors for that. So through 2020, as we were sort of looking at it, it was, um, it was obviously a really hard year for, for um, everyone in the tourism industry, but young people did tend to bear um, some of the more significant um, issues if you're looking at you know, redundancies, reduction in working hours, um, you know, increased casualization and, and this sort of thing. So towards the end of 2020, we started looking at, well, how does, you know, how does YTN um, adopt these challenges moving forward? How do we address these challenges? And it was about this time that we were discussing a new partnership with VTIC about how um, VTIC and YTN would, would work together. And it was really good in these, in these early discussions with Felicia, and she's been a fantastic support of this, to establish a YTN position on the Policy Advisory Council. Um, and that's around you know, providing a structural voice for young people to you know, voice their um, concerns, to, to listen in, to, to hear what the issues are that are being addressed by others um, in the industry. But it, I think it's really important to acknowledge this isn't a, it's not a tokenistic, um, you know, it's not a shout, it's not a, oh, hey, hey, here's a, here's a seat at a meeting, you know, join the Zoom every now and then sort of thing. Um, YTN certainly intends to use this as a way to um, get the voices of young people in tourism heard. Uh, and we're going to, uh, and vitally to this is, is it's a structural um, partnership. So this is going to be um, happening over the next few years and, and I really hope uh, beyond that once um, you know, when, when partnerships are extended and, and this sort of thing. One of the, I think one of the, um, the key problems is that we're going to be looking at in tourism over the next few years, which everyone is aware of, is this labour force shortage uh, er, around the working holiday makers. Tourism has been reliant on that all over Australia for, for a number of years. Um, with the reduction of this workforce, we're going to be looking domestically for how we can you know, engage young people to pursue a career in tourism, um, hospitality, events, um, particularly in those areas which, which previously had had a lot of working holiday makers. So, so key to this is, it's going to be understanding, well, what motivates young people to work in tourism? Um, what motivates people to, you know, seek out that first job? Um, why do they pursue tourism as opposed to retail or, you know, something else? And Young Tourism Network really wants to position itself as being that, um, I guess, um, repository, I'm always, <laughs> I'm always wary of using that word because I'm worried I'll get the wrong one, um, of wisdom when it comes to, to young people and, and, you know, providing insight and saying, well, this is what young people think. This is where, where their pressure points are at the moment. This is, you know, um, the issues that they're sort of facing. And YTN is, in, is really well placed to do that, not because we have more than, you know, more than 200 members, but also we have an incredibly close working relationship with the educational, um, our educational partners, who I thank uh, for all their support. Uh, so, so we can really be that conduit between industry, education and the students that are coming through. In recognition of this labour force challenge, um, earlier this year in March, when JobKeeper finished, uh, Young Tourism Network partnered with Regeneration Projects to, to actually do some research around, well, how was 2020 for young people? And how can we ensure that uh, young people are engaged in tourism moving forward? So I'm not going to spoil all the, all the insights from that. Some of you may have already read the report, which is, which is freely available on the Young Tourism Network um, website. Um, but on the 20th of October, we're going to be doing a, uh, an event around presenting the findings of that. And we've got some, some quite strong recommendations there for industry, for businesses, and also for government, um, which we've presented over the last couple of months. I also, I just really want to take up this opportunity before I finish and can go to any, any questions that may have come up. I really want to thank um, Kate Rickwood from, from VTIC, who's, who's been a fantastic um, support and service for Young Tourism Network, not just over the last couple of years, but over the last, um, uh, I think, five years she's been invo involved with YTN and, and VTIC. Uh, she was, you know, really, really drove some of this research and, and she's been a fantastic um, yeah, asset to, to both YTN and, and no doubt VTIC. And I know that uh, most people on the call today will have engaged with Kate at, at some point. So um, yeah, thank you very much, Kate. And looking forward to, to finishing this year off with a few more presentations um, about the research that we, that we did earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, from me, Felicia, that's, that's all I wanna say. I wanna say, you know, if, if anyone does wanna engage with YTN, please reach out um, and yeah, happy to take any questions if they've come through or, or um, anything else. 
Thanks, Hugh. And and can I say um, thanks for acknowledging Kate. I know she has worked uh, tirelessly with the group and, and Kate is actually the one that provides that secretariat um, support that we talked about before. And um, and I know it's YTN is, is well embedded in all of the VTIC staff because we've got um, a number of our staff who have come up through YTN and in fact, even a couple of the new staff that we've just hired. So they got extra bonus points on their application for um, indicating that they were part of YTN. So um, no, it's been, it's been terrific. And I, I do want to acknowledge also, Hugh, you spoke about, um, you know, using your position on this policy advisory council, you know, effectively. You made some incredible contribution, even uh, most recently in the development of our four point plan and a lot of the work that we did um, both through our sector roundtables and then of course the, the policy advisory council to finalize that plan and, and um, the input that you provided was um, you know, very well received and, and respected in the context of, of um, what we landed on. So you have already started using that position effectively and I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I just wanted to just confirming if, if people are interested in finding out more, connecting, they can just do so via the website, Hugh. Can they sign up there? Yeah, just go through youngtourismnetwork.com.au. Um, yeah, we've got the sign up details there. If you are interested in becoming a member, it's uh, 50 bucks for one year, $80 for two years. I think they've been the same price for the last 15 years. So we're very consistent <laughs> operators in that regard. Uh, but we've also, you know, we're really open to, to industry partnerships and innovation in that regard. We've got some fantastic industry partners in Australian Venue Co. Uh, and also um, Clementine's, uh, which is a, a fantastic retail shop just down on DeGrave Street. Yeah. Um, so yeah, drop us an email um, and yeah, look, we'll, we'll be around for a very long time um, and we're looking forward to it. Thanks, you. And I, I think also too, you, you um, failed to mention the great piece of work that um, YTN did in response to the national project on reshaping the visitor economy in Australia. I know that um, the team put quite a lot of work into that as well and um, made a submission to the federal government. So well done to the group. It is really, um, you know, pushing forward in leaps and bounds. So congratulations to you and, uh, and all the team at YTN. Great. Yeah, thanks a lot, Felicia. That's okay, Hugh. Thank you. Um, oh, hang on. There is a question actually that's just popped through. Um, new to YTN, so it might already exist, but one thing that I feel would be beneficial is a database of those currently working in the industry that are part of YTN that other members can reach out to and use. So just, yeah. a, I guess, a, a way of connecting through, through some new channels. They're just asking, does this already exist? It might well do. Yeah, so, well, if you're a member of YTN, you get access to our members portal, which has a whole bunch of resources, whether it's about, you know, preparing for a job interview, um, etc. But you can also look through other YTN members who have chosen to list their details on there. So it tells you the organisations they work for, uh, where they study, if they've studied that. So it, it can be used as a really good networking tool. Um, otherwise, also just attending our events, um, you know, uh, virtually or, or in person. Um, that's a great way just to meet people and get a bit of a foot in the door and um, see where other people are at. Absolutely. Looking forward to those face-to-face -face events. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, thanks. Thanks, you. Um, our next topic, you heard me uh, speak a moment ago about the Lynette Bergen Tourism Award. And I want to share with everyone now just a little bit more about that award before I introduce Brendan to talk about his experiences over, over the past, well, what's been now two years, Brendan. <laughs> you got a, you got an extra year on this one. Um, the Lynette Bergen Tourism Award is actually a grant for an individual seeking professional and uh, personal growth and for someone who strives to benefit the Victorian tourism and events industry. The award has actually been named in honour of Lynette Bergen and seeks to perpetuate the skills and contribution that Lynette made to the industry and to celebrate the guiding hand that she so frequently offered to the industry and to her colleagues and in particular to new recruits to the industry. The award actually offers um, a grant of up to $8,000 for the recipient to undertake an industry-related case study and a further $1,000 for the recipient's employer. And since first awarded in 2005, we've seen most of the previous recipients of the Lynette Bergen Award remaining in our industry, which is so critical right now. 
but um, also many of those now taking on new leadership roles and four of, um, of our recipients now manage their own very successful businesses in the industry. So it's just been a tremendous launching pad for so many careers and, and something again that VTech is so proud to be able to support and, and bring to the industry. Applications for this award are actually also now open, uh, but they'll be closing next Friday, the 15th of October. Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, I mentioned Brendan in talking about this award and what it's meant over the, the past year. Um, Brendan Sanders was the 2019 award winner for the Lynette Bergen Award. And sadly, because of 2020, normally, Brendan, you would have come and you would have presented the outcomes from this, uh, from this project at, at the conference, which we weren't unfortunately able to, to um, hold. But um, Brendan will be talking about his, um, his project now with us, which we're really thrilled to be able to deliver that after such a a long time since the award was given. Um, Brendan is the business manager at Tourism Greater Geelong and the Ballerine, and his project has actually tackled the subject of purpose beyond profit. Um, unfortunately, as I said, Brendan wasn't able to share his findings with us until now, um, but he will take us through the outcomes from the research, providing practical information on purpose-driven organizations that the industry can use for long-term impact. So welcome, Brendan, and lovely to have you with us here today, finally. <laughs> thank you, Felicia, and um, thank you um, to VTIC as well for the opportunity to um, I guess explore this topic and bring back some insights um, that I can able, that I can share with the Victorian tourism industry in what I hope will really help guide and shape um, a critical change that's probably needed over the next few mm. years. In particular, mm. um, this is a highly valuable, um, I guess, mindset for businesses and personally to tackle as well as we move forward. Um, and as I mentioned, um, it's purpose beyond profit. And, I, and I'm very clear on the distinction that needs to be made that this is purpose beyond profit um, versus over profit. And um, I'll just move to see if I can click onto that next one. For me personally, um, this has all been about turning passion into action. So this very much started out a bit as a passion project. Um, and while I haven't had the opportunity to present um, uh, last year, but I'm very thankful that I've got the opportunity to, to share my insights now. I've definitely taken that, all the learnings, knowledge um, that I've gained over the past two years in particular to really shape um, and bring into my own organisation the work that I do to help really drive change from within. Which brings me on to this one, which is probably one of the biggest takeaways that I've gained um, in terms of growth and being able to find my North Star moment. Impact in Entrepreneur. It's about driving change from within. While we're not all owners or run businesses, managers of businesses, for example, we are all in a position that we can influence change in some way. So I think that's a really important concept to embrace, particularly um, for the young people working in the industry as well. Um, no matter what your role, you have the opportunity to drive change um, and embrace change. This is probably one of my favorite photos that I took along my journeys. This was in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I found it on a footpath. And I really find this really sums up the ideology behind Purpose Beyond Profit and what it means to businesses versus businesses that dr are driven by profit um, singly. I think um, embracing this as a collective offers our greatest opportunity to breed change. Um, this is about driving change from within. And I challenge you all to also just, as I take you through my journey um, and some practical tips at the end, how are you embracing your role as an entrepreneur? There's a fantastic group that I encourage everyone to look up. It's called the League of Entrepreneurs. It's a global organization. Um, basically, it's, it's a foundation of group members that are working within um, major institutions, major organizations, with people driving change from within. And I think that's our biggest opportunity moving forward. During my travels, um, you'd be thinking, what has this got to do with anything? But during my travels, very short period of two months um, travel journey just before the lockdown. So I was very thankful that I managed to squeeze that in. These are major milestones that were pumped through the mainstream media. 
So I don't have to explain any of these ones. The one on the right was actually a photo that I took in New York myself and everyone would have seen these type of photos blasted around, but it just shows there was global support towards the bushfire crisis in particular for Australia. Um, however, what I wanna point out is these are the stories that didn't make it to the mainstream media um, right across. And as a, the, I was lucky enough to get, um, be a part of or see um, four of the five of these firsthand um, during my journeys. So on the left, um, I'm referring to JetBlue to de declaring a mission towards clean fuel. An industry formerly known with dirty travel, JetBlue agreed to purchase sustainable renewal, a, renewable aviation fuel from 2020, produced from 100% waste like food scraps. This fuel produces 80% less carbon footprint. Fantastic initiative by an airline. The second one there is Yukon released its first sustainable destination plan. Before they had any idea on how to measure, measure sustainable success, they went forward with a sustainable destination master plan. The middle one there, uh, fantastic example with Microsoft declaring carbon neutrality, uh, basically of its entire existence. So, but dating right back to 20, by 2020, 2050, um, they want to, remove all the carbon that they've had and driven through their entire life. By 2030, they want to become carbon neutral. So it's a good balance how businesses have, the, the progression from sustainability to regeneration progresses as well. It's a step change as you work through. You've got to walk before you run. The third one, uh, the fourth one there is Harbour Air, the, the air service that takes you between Victoria and Vancouver Island. Um, they've released a whole fleet of electric aircraft on a mission to go carbon zero. And then on the right hand side, managed to watch this one come in and I was curious, I didn't realize what was happening until I Googled it later, but two hybrid ferries transported into Victoria, Canada, BC. Um, the BC ferries reduced, they want to reduce their greenhouse gases by 2030 by 40% and 80% by 2050. So I just, all these things happen in a space of two months and I'm just imagine what's happened over the last two years. So what is it that we're actually talking about here? Um, purpose beyond profit. It's exactly how it sounds. Um, it's a concept that's been around um, for many decades. It's no new concept, but what we need to do now is take this into the heart of the service sector, the tourism industry. We need what we've seen, um, I think there's been analysis through the Financial Times, looking at the top 500 um, uh, big businesses. They're, the businesses that are leading with purpose beyond profit are six times more likely, uh, return six times more profit. Um, it's What purpose beyond profit is all about is doing business with a deeper meaning, giving back and supporting those you rely on to make a living. Your why evolves from going an inward facing perspective to an outward faking focus. With purpose over profit, it's not for everyone, but purpose beyond profit, make no mistake, is definitely for everyone. So why the tourism industry? In my opinion, the tourism industry is one of, if not the best industry to help drive change for good. Travel broadens perspective. It has the effortless ability to lead the change that is needed and feed a newfound passion from, for people for a better and sustainable future. We in the tourism industry have a critical role and responsibility to play. But why now? What this, for me personally, this started out as something nice to have for the industry. But as time went on and we collectively faced challenge after challenge, it has since become something of a necessity for us. To come out of this stronger, we need to think with purpose. It's an opportunity to reset and restart. Why now? Consumers want it, destinations need it, and businesses thrive on it. Consumers want it. Um, these are two great examples that I came across in my journeys. The Nulla Project, easy, convenient, re reusable service. They've taken the consumer demand of reusable cups, looking for eco-friendly ways to have their coffee. This happens in Victoria, Canada. Um, you pay a five, de five dollar deposit fee and you get that reusable cup. You can take it to any of the participating, and I think they had upwards of 30 participating coffee shops within Victoria. 
you can either hand it back over after you're finished to get your $5 back, or you can just keep using it between each of the coffee shops. Fantastic way to get rid of that um, paper coffee cup um, example. The second one there is wonderful Copenhagen. Everyone's probably heard of the local hood, how they went out strong with the tourism strategy for tourism is dead. I managed to experience that firsthand when I went to Copenhagen. I caught up with a friend. He took me around to one of the local hoods. I experienced the oldest restaurant uh, in, in Copenhagen itself and try to really, um, they like their odd fish uh, meals. So I tried something that I didn't, that I wouldn't have experienced before without this e exploration into, um, I guess, the local lifestyle and experiences, which I found really, that's the thing that I brought back. I didn't bring back the memory of seeing the Little Mermaid. I brought back the little experience that I managed to have with a friend while I was over there. Destinations need it. These are two great examples of how regional tourism organisations, tourism boards are driving change and working with operators to drive change as well. First slide I had, I showed a picture of an orca whale. That's in um, Victoria there. These are eagle wind tours that I'm providing the example here as well. They've, over the past um, 10 years, they've um, saved up 668,000 that's gone towards the 1% for the planet. Why is that critical? They've partnered up with Tourism Victoria over there. And the whale population is now down to around 71 um, killer whales, Eastern resident whales. There's the Chinook salmon that's gone from millions down to thousands of population. Their whole destination was built on that experience. Without those, they don't have a destination or an experience to offer from the wildlife perspective. So the from that perspective, this is where the collaboration between tour operators and destinations have really teamed up to take on that bigger meaning of, it's not just about working on a financial basis, but we've got to support these businesses. We've got to support the community to survive. Sedona Chamber of Commerce, fantastic example um, as well. Population of 10,000, 3 million visitors annually. There's a conflict of over tourism there. They set up a program called Sedona Cares Pledge, which is a huge collaboration between um, industry, consumer um, and visitor, where it's all about pledging. When you visit, you make a pledge to support the 10 um, reasons that Sedona, to support sustainable visits to um, Sedona. Highly recommend having a look at that one in further detail. Um, and businesses thrive on it uh, very quickly. Right-hand examples, the body shop, 7.5% up and operating in the billions of dollars. Their growth in profits. It, these two examples really show that businesses led with purpose are uh, experiencing far stronger growth and are able to come back stronger um, when businesses align to purpose. Um, highly recommend um, having a look into these two examples as well. I'm going to very quickly sum up um, what the numbers say. So there's a lot of examples out there, um, but going through these one by one, sustainability is driving accommodation, accommodation decisions moving forward. Booking.com, over 55% of travellers are more determined to make sustainable travel choices than a year ago. 70% of global travellers would be more likely to book an accommodation knowing it was eco-friendly, whether they were looking for a sustainable stay or not. Climate change impacts destination appeal. 75% of UK residents said they were concerned about climate change. And one in seven residents also said they would choose to travel in their home country as they felt that was more eco-friendly. And particularly over in Europe, there's a whole um, wave of, um, I guess they call it flight shaming, for example. The, the, there's a huge issue over there. Companies with purpose beyond profit can make more profit. Profit. Financial Times goes on to show that those guided by purpose beyond profit return six times more shareholders than um, uh, returns to shareholders than explicitly profit-driven rivals. And according to a Deloitte survey, 80% of executives believe companies perform better over time if their purpose goes beyond profit. Purpose feeds loyalty. Ernest and Young survey. 89% said uh, of executives felt a strong sense of collective purpose drives employee satisfaction. 80% said it helps increase customer loyalty. 
the numbers keep going on and on, all in favour that purpose beyond profit drives stronger, better business. So why, why is it that you need to take this on? Summing up, stronger profits, greater retention, and a better future for all. During my journey, I caught up with and continue to meet amazing people doing amazing things. What do they all have in common? They're all change champions. We often overcomplicate and overthink some of the simplest things. And after listening to these amazing people, I've taken my greatest learnings from them and turned them into 10 easy steps for transitioning business into, a, into one that considers a purpose beyond profit. So 10 steps, first one, give it ownership. Somebody needs to lead the evolution and that's, from within. Um, and as I go through these as well, I'll mention um, I've created a website which delves into each of these in a lot more detail on how you can actually um, enroll these. I've got great case examples, so I'll provide that um, resource at the end of this presentation. Nothing changes if no one leads. Um, this makes the impact feel real. It's 100% a team effort and can only succeed if it is. What this really means is that someone is in charge leading engagement and driving changes in mindsets. Someone needs to take a lead. Make a pledge. Pin it up for the world to see in your strategy. This is actually a coffee shop in Docklands. Um, they've pinned that on um, their, their coffee desk, actually, which is about um, their whole purpose. Fantastic. Um, think like a not-for-profit. Um, background photo is a kayak in Copenhagen in the Visitor Information Centre. It's actually a commercial business, but the whole experience is you get to go down a stream, but along your way, you're doing good by um, they encouraging you to pick up green, uh, like waste, for example. So challenge your employees to think like this. This is probably one of the most critical pieces um, that you can take on, thinking like a not-for-profit. This helps foster a self-led culture shift. Um, Thinking like a not-for-profit means considering why you do things, for who and how. Get all this right and the dollars will follow. Number four, it's more than just being green. You need to consider all the pillars together. This is a shot that I took in um, New Delhi in India. It's a government-run cottage industries emporium. Um, what they do is basically they take all the rural artisans of India, uh, around India directly and instead... Um, all the money goes directly to the art, rural artisans. So you're cutting out the middleman, um, which is quite important through that process. Number five there, make it who you are, not what you do. People pay for the what and return for the why. So think purpose beyond profit, not over profit. And this is probably one of my greatest learnings that I took from um, Daryl Wade, one of the founders from Intrepid. Um, and it was probably one of my first engagements and really threw my first um, hypothesis on its head, which I felt, uh, which is quite a good eye opener. What it means is that you should never lose sight of the real reason your business exists. For Intrepid, it is to create immersive, authentic local experiences that will be remembered for a lifetime. So while they are a proud B Corp and globally recognised leader in living the purpose beyond profit, they never lose sight of the reason for being and purpose becomes a culture of what they do. Um, yeah, this is an important distinction for businesses to make and it's the difference between profitable businesses and disorientated businesses. Don't get disorientated by the desire to do good. Your purpose must be genuine. Genuine People won't believe you otherwise. Sincerity and clarity is your best friend here. Start small. This is actually in Bunnings. Um, at their coffee coffee stand. Quick wins, get the wheels spinning. This is probably one of the important things that we as entrepreneurs need to do as well. Um, this is most true when we are talking about sustainability, new concepts and leading change within an organisation where you are not the sole stakeholder. This doesn't mean think small, you should be ambitious and that is what your vision needs to reflect. Starting small is a way to best achieve this. Quick wins, leads into bigger wins across a short, medium, long term. And why is momentum important? Because the greatest challenges and biggest changes are best tackled together. 
With momentum, you gain traction. Your stakeholder groups are able to visualize and appreciate change, and you're able to foster genuine buying. It feeds a bottom-up approach. Um, and uh, focus on what's not working, a simple but overlooked concept. Think local, invest local. Um, strong community equals strong foundations. This is highly um, specific to the, um, important for the tourism industry to embrace. Being a locals first company is probably one of the best long-term strategies you can employ. And number 10, finally, don't forget your supply chain. Consider everything and everyone. This was a fantastic example from Vancouver Aquarium. They just made a small change, a supply in China individually wrapped each of their um, gift shop items. What they did, they sent us a little screenshot of exactly what they wanted, which was just provide a bag for all the toys. So they all sat in one bag. Very simple concept, but it removed immense amount of single use plastics from, from, the, um, from the chain, essentially. And it's a simple, you can't tell them how to run their business, but you can tell them how you want to run your business. Keep that in mind. Quote that um, I developed along my journey, the beauty behind purpose is the beauty achieved with purpose. Um, so that's, that's it from me. Um, and I'd highly recommend checking out peaktourismfutures.com. This is where I've got the foundation of all my research and insights, and learnings and case examples, um, where I delve into each of those 10 steps and the reason for doing this a lot more. Um, Thanks, Felicia, and thank you everyone for listening. Hope that did provide a little bit of insight and happy to take yeah. any questions. <laughs> no, Brendan, very, very thought-provoking. And I think really timely, you're right, when you, did this project back in 2019 who would have thought that you know kind of 18 months from now or from that time rather that it would be everything would shift to really focus on this issue of sustainability it's become a really big um i think a moral compass for a lot of people values have changed post pandemic although mind you we're not out of it yet but you can already see those those values shifting and and morphing and businesses consumers are seeking out businesses that embrace the kind of traits that you've just spoken about. So, you know, while you kind of, as I said, started this back in 2019, the, um, I think the ramifications of it and the salience of it are now even more critical and more lively than when you began. Um, there is a question here, Brendan, from Matt Seitz. Um, he wants to know, how could you see young entrepreneurs, that's a tough one to get your mouth around isn't it um, in tourism working with established leaders to embed purpose beyond profit into their businesses and what do you think some practical first steps could be based on your experience conversation i think um and building that engagement that chain of um connection so if you're already working in an organization, it's a lot easier when you're working in a small organization, I feel. Um, particularly, that's what I've found through my experience. We've got a staff of 18 people. And um, over the last two years, I've definitely noticed that um, a, through a couple of small initiatives that we've done in-house, that's later on led into a, um, something that's on the leadership discussion on a regular basis and really formed part of our next four year corporate plan, which is fantastic to see. So you've actually, I've actually witnessed um, through conversation and initiation that you've managed to watch this um, really happen. And to be honest, it, it's about learning from people as well. Collaboration um, is also a critical component of that. There's some fantastic groups going around being involved, I think. Um, Impact Travel Alliance is also a great initiative out there as well that you can get involved in. Um, I've just set up a new chapter um, through, through my le um, learnings here, but for a chapter for Geelong in the Great Ocean Road region of Impact Travel Alliance. Um, so I think learning, engaging and collaboration um, is all critical. I think one of, the, one of the things that we did at the very offset was um, I small initiative, put a small coffee, reusable coffee cup, create a customer um, coffee cup on each of our staff members' desk with a little note to say, use this over the year, you get 
um, you're, you're saving X number of trees, X number of paper, X number of water. Join the mission. It will be fantastic to see what we can achieve. People really took that on. And over time, we've seen new grant, uh, new plants pop up in the office. It's really turned into a green office. We've seen missions change. People really embrace it. We've used less paper, et cetera. It's about starting the conversation however way you want as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and making people really well, well aware. Um, while there aren't questions, there are heaps of um, comments that are coming up in the chat, Brendan, which I'm following here. But mm -hmm. basically the synopsis is that fabulous presentation everyone is incredibly inspired i love this comment that someone's posted my new fave words to live by don't ask what the new normal will be ask what is the best future we can craft and i think that's um that's an incredible statement but um reminds me a bit of a colleague of mine that i spoke to um up in new south wales actually but said that they're not talking about build back better they're talking about build back best and I think that's actually a really interesting way to look at all of this. Like, how do we improve what we've been doing? Because it does really matter. It matters to our future, but I think importantly, as you've highlighted, it matters to our customers. Absolutely. And that's what improves our business sustainability. So um, look, I just wanna say thank you so much. It's been amazing listening to this. And I'm just disappointed that um, we didn't, couldn't give you the live platform of a conference to do that last Sorry. year, Brendan. But as I say, I think your, um, you know, your findings are even more important right now than they probably were two years ago. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, so thank you. Thank you everything. very much. Thank you, Felicia. Um, now it's my pleasure, and she's been waiting very patiently here, Vanessa, thank you so much. But it's my, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Vanessa Laricella. Um, Vanessa is a William Anglis student who actually wowed the judges this year in our entrepreneurial, or maybe we might have to change that, Brendan, and now call it an entrepreneurial award. But for the moment, Vanessa's the winner of our 2021 entrepreneurial award. And as I said, she wowed the, um, wowed the judges with the winning submission against counterparts from uh, Vic Uni, from Melbourne Polytechnic, from Holmes Glen and from Chisholm Institute. So you can see the breadth of our TAFE partners that are involved in this award, which has been really great as it's evolved over the last few years that we've been running it. Vanessa's idea, In Touch Tours, leverages the accessible tourism market, but with a focus on children and young adults with autism. Vanessa's impressive idea exemplified the spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation shown in the annual competition. And we are so grateful, Vanessa, that you're here to share this with us today because it is a really remarkable concept and you're just to be applauded in the work that you've done in creating it. So over to you. Thank you, I'll just get this set up. <laughs> Okay, so good morning everyone watching. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank VTIC for having me be part of today's webinar. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, Jess Durham who encouraged me to enter the VTIC Student Entrepreneur Awards. So thank you, Jess. I know that you've tuned in today. I would also like to acknowledge lecturers Nari Griggs and R Lynn Richardson uh, from William Anglis for their support during um, the award. So In Touch Tours was developed from a research brief provided by Parks Victoria within one of my marketing units last semester. The brief was to design a new visitor experience within Wilson's Promontory that is accessible in response to a gap in this market. I chose to focus um, specifically on autism due to the limited number of products available uh, Sorry, due to the limited products available. Through my research, only social scripts are available from Parks Victoria that were co-developed with a maze um, as part of that marketing class. I presented the concept to Parks Victoria and received positive feedback. Um, so In Touch Tours is a tour company with an objective that leverages the accessible tourism markets, market as mentioned by Felicia. Um, so In Touch Tours is unique as it incorporates sensory engagement, creative expression and technology, a combination within a natural setting, which would be the first of its kind in Australia. 
The two are combined, a nature walk with a sensory scavenger hunt, ending with a creative expression workshop. Tours would operate in small groups and take place in less populated areas of Wilson's Crumb, as indicated on the map on the screen. So upon booking the tour, a short questionnaire is sent to gather an understanding of individuals' interests, what they hope to see, um, and requests that can help make the visit more enjoyable. A social script would also be provided. So upon arrival, an iPad will be handed to each individual that encompasses an interactive map with plants and animals to look out for and virtually collect during the walking tour. The purpose of this is to promote active participation. It also removes aspects people with autism may find uncomfortable, such as eye contact, and considers those who are nonverbal to ensure that they're just involved as everyone else. So sensory elements are added into the tour to encourage further engagement and participation um, of those with hyposensory autism, as research has demonstrated they benefit from this type of interaction. During the experience, individuals are invited to use their senses to engage with the surrounding environment. A creative expression class is held at the end of the tour that invites participants to draw or paint. The purpose of this is to allow for reflection on the experience, express how they feel, and to capture their favorite moment. A sensory box is also given to participants to take home as a reminder of the tour. This allows for those who may have not have been comfortable participating on the day to experience the sensory elements in the comfort of their own home. So inside the box includes a QR code that plays a recording of sounds you would hear in nature during um, as you walk around Wilson's Promontory, a sense um, of smell is engaged through a variety of dried native flora and fauna. A small paint set is included along with a blank postcard for self-reflection that mimics the creative expression class held um, at the end of the tour on the day. A jar of Australian wildflower seeds acts as a visual activity that aids in understanding and experiencing the regeneration process that naturally occurs in nature. And lastly, a personalized cookie is included to engage taste buds as a sweet treat that also supports local businesses. The sensory boxes would also be available to purchase online and at local businesses throughout Gippsland. So the Victorian visitor economy indicates tourism to be a significant contributor. In 2016 to 2017, 200,000 jobs were generated for people across Melbourne and regional Victoria bringing an estimated $26.7 billion to the economy. Um, in this, Parks Victoria was seen as a significant contributor to the state government's goal of increasing visitors by the end of 2025. The government acknowledged Parks Victoria's role in, the in um, our economy through funding $23 million um, that would be used over four years. This funding is being now spent on park management, making the parks more accessible and infrastructure improvements, which includes a new visitor centre. So according to Parks Victoria, nature-based tourism is one of the fastest growing sectors in global tourism and is considered one of the main motivators for travel. In addition, there is a growing market for accessible tourism experiences and increased opportunities of leisure activities funded by the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, so just highlighting the accessible tourism market, um, so they represent 7% of the Victorian population, spending around $680 million annually, which equates to 4% of total domestic spending. And those with a cognitive disability make up 31% of disabilities in all travellers or in travellers. Um, in addition, autism is seen to be present more frequently in children and young adults. So how In Touch Tours supports the visitor economy? Um, so they support the visitor economy through providing a product that supports regional Victoria's reputation on becoming more accessible, providing employment opportunities for individuals in regional Victoria, as well as those with autism. And it provides opportunity for NDIS funded um, accessible experiences, which in turn can increase visitation to regional Victoria. Um, so to ensure that the information I shared about the chosen target market was valid and reliable, 
I did a lot of research reading journal articles um, that studied the behavior patterns, mental therapy, and learning activities. So in addition to this, I, was, I also visited the NDI, NDIS website um, and non-for-profit organizations to further gain information. Um, from this research, the key takeaways were that creative expression has been proven to enhance communication, aid in building relationships, and can improve coping skills um, and overall has a positive impact on behavior. So research found people with autism are usually at a high risk for anxiety. Due to this, they can exhibit expressive emotion related difficulties when put in situations they feel anxious. Uh, spending time in nature has strong health benefits and can reduce anxiety, lower blood, pr blood pressure and improve mental health. And lastly, in recent years, um, technology has been on the rise as a coping mechanism for those um, who travel with autism. Due to the familiar usage of phones and tablets, which makes uh, new environments more manageable. Uh, so now I just want to share a timeline of how in touch tours as a business would develop um, from the initial concept to the end goal. Um, so tours would initially commence in Wilson's Promontory, Gippsland, and then will expand into other regional areas such as Phillip Island, the Danny Nong Ranges, um, and the Grampians to further um, visitor dispersal and spending in regional Victoria areas. So through the business journey, there will also be a collaboration with Parks Victoria, Amaze and Autism Spectrum, um, as well as working alongside Gippsland Accessible Tourism Partnership Group, who are committed to um, growing accessible tourism experiences. So tour guide training, interpretation training, and courses on how to conduct tours um, for the clientele will be provided. Um, this will aid in the further development of employment opportunities and skill building for those in regional Victoria, as well as those with autism. So insight from these employees would also contribute to a more robust business. Um, in Touch Tours will become a registered provider with NDIS to further promote visitation to individuals with autism to Wilson's Promontory. And the end goal would be that In Touch Tours um, expand out to those regional areas mentioned earlier. Um, and as well as the, the user market being expanded to those with hearing and vision impairments. So this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening to how my submission um, of In Touch Tours could increase visitation to regional Victoria and create job opportunities. Thank you, Vanessa. And um, there's a, a quick little comment in here from um, Michaela at Gippsland, Destination Gippsland. And she's um, just reinforced that accessible tourism is something that we at Destination Gippsland are very passionate about and currently working on updating our strategy. When with Gippsland becoming a large nature-based tourism region, your tours are such a great idea. And she's looking very forward to communicating your presentation to her team. So I think we need to facilitate that presentation as well. She said that you had presented to um, Parks Victoria, but um, yeah, I think Destination Gippsland is probably pretty keen as well. So um, we we'll, we'll might need to work through with that, work through that with you separately. Yeah. Um, hang on, because um, I do have people Everyone is actually using the chat as well. So this is just a little bit tricky, guys. I was trying to avoid going into two platforms, but bear with me one second. Um, yeah, just congratulations, Vanessa. Great to see more development of product in the disability space. Um, really awesome work. I think everyone is incredibly interested. What I'd like to... Um, um, what I'd like to think about is how we can actually also facilitate, Vanessa, for you to present to some of those other targets that you were looking at. You talked about um, Philip Island Nature Parks and, and also Grampians. And I think, you know, I'll talk with um, Kate about this offline, but I think we can probably facilitate you presenting to those areas as well, because I think they'd really benefit from um, the background and knowledge that you've shared. Yeah, um, yeah just lots of great, great... Um, just great comments here. Congratulations. There's a comment, Vanessa. Also, please check out Ladybugs Autism for Young Girls. Sorry, it's Yellow Ladybugs. She's corrected. So um, you might want to have a look at that one if you're not already across it. Oh, yeah. Um, and someone else is suggesting to speak with Mandy Leggett, who works with the Indigenous Folks for Bass Coast. 
um, might also be an interested point. So we might take a lot of this offline with you, Vanessa, and we'll take a look at how we can make some of those introductions for you to some of those other groups. But thank you so very much. That was um, it's quite amazing. And I just love the effort and the, the depth that you've gone to to really connect with not just accessible tourism as a whole, because obviously it is really critical, but I think the other piece of this is really focusing on on. Uh, young people and young adults with um, with autism. So well done to you on this one. It's a fabulous and fascinating project. Thank you. Um, well, we're just about coming to a close, guys. And I just wanted to, um, first of all, thank everyone for hanging in there with us. I think we've had um, we've had a few people drop off, but we've still got most of everyone that was with us from the beginning. So, um, you know, I think there's been some tremendous insights from three incredible um, young, I, I hate to say young people, we call them young leaders now instead of young people, because I think, you know, I'd like to think that what we're doing is working on creating, you know, the legacy for our future. And you guys are it, you know, we really do need to think about how we encourage and how we facilitate all the things that are necessary for you guys to, um, I think as the expression is said, it has said, you know, give you guys the keys to the car because we're getting a bit too old to drive these days. So um, I'm looking very forward to working with all of you as we start to do this more into the future. There's so many areas of connect and, and areas of collaboration that I think we need to be engaging with all of you on and really working through how we can present new opportunities for people coming up through our industry. And most importantly, I think, show that there are pathways for growth and pathways for career progression and development. That's just so critical in keeping um, young people like yourselves engaged with what we're doing into the future. So I wanna thank you all so very much for joining us to Vanessa, Brendan, and of course to Hugh. Um, but I also just wanted to quickly talk about the what's next. Um, first of all, uh, Hugh did mention that on the 20th of October, we actually have the Young Voices in Tourism to be presented by YTN. I've had the pleasure and and um, I guess the, the um, it, it was very difficult to listen to this, this presentation, I have to say. That's why I'm stuttering for the words because there's some real insights here around what um, young people are looking for in engaging with our industry and some of the concerns that you have about where we are at the moment and where you would like to see us move to in order to really um, attract and enhance our relationship with, um, with the leaders of tomorrow for our sector. So I think you know, we really do need to try. I'm going to work very hard to make sure that a lot of our counterparts in some of the larger organizations that are our members are listening to this um, message now on the 20th because it's really important to understand what we need to do to encourage and foster and build those relationships. Um, beyond the 20th of October, uh, we also have a couple of things I wanted to point out in terms of the different awards that were announced and, and spoken about today. Um, could you do the next slide, please, just so I can get to those dates for closing? Thanks very much. Um, the Lynette Bergen Award, obviously, Brendan has taken us through the amazing journey he's been on back in 2019. You can have that journey for you yourself as well. Applications for the Lynette Bergen Tourism Award will close on the 15th of October. Uh, I mentioned before the Melbourne Tourism Leadership Program applications will close on Monday, the 8th of November. You can register for um, MTIL via the VTIC website. And of course, uh, the Student Entrepreneurial Award, semester one, um, 2022 is when we will start that, um, uh, the applications for that next segment. And we'll be working through, of course, the individual universe, TAFE University, or, sorry, TAFE um, colleges that we work with on this program. So um, we'll be, you know, anxiously awaiting getting back out and talking about the award for next year because it has really given us fantastic ideas and inspiration for how we can create new products and experiences to keep Victoria front of mind and really growing and developing. And I think Vanessa, your idea today is just one more example of the amazing um, insight that's out there and the intuition about what consumers are looking for, uh, not just now, but into the years ahead. 
So again, can I, I thank all of our presenters today, but also want to thank each of you for being on the line with us here. I think it has been inspirational. We've heard that from so many people in the comments and the chat. Um, but thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you for sharing your passion. And thank you for being a part of our industry because we certainly need you to be with us on this journey over the, the next many months and years ahead as we work toward recovery. So thank you again, and we'll look forward to seeing you all on the 20th of October.